So now I would like to welcome all the people who join us on the Click Meeting platform for this second webinar of the Singmin uh, project. We are today uh, uh, three of us, uh, Daniel uh, Chanan, and actually Julia is here with us. Hello, everybody. <laughs> to talk about uh, the, the, uh, one of the three handbooks that were designed and created in the frame of the, of the uh, Singmin project. So we have prepared a, sl a small presentation for you, but we will start now and start explaining to you what we'll talk about and how we can actually interact, all of you. So maybe I could introduce myself before I introduce uh, in a few minutes my, my colleagues. So I am Conferent Cooper, the project manager of the European Choral Association. European Choral Association has set up this project with uh, uh, different partners. So we'll explain that in a few minutes. Um, and we wanted to, to uh, also share this um, handbooks uh, with a broader audience by setting up this webinar. So you are really welcome. Just to let you know that these webinars are also uh, broadcast on Facebook at this moment. And if you, if you are following that on Facebook, I would really invite you to actually follow the link that you can find in the comments of this video and join us on the platform so we can also interact. Because a webinar is not only just a conference, and, but you can also, in a way, raise your hand and ask questions and interact with us along the way during this, this about 50 minutes, one hour, we can spend together if you, if you want. So how to webinar, that was my first slide. The main uh, uh, function uh, we can use to, to chat would be to use the, the chat function. So you will see on the right corner of your screen uh, a little chat. You can say hello, and it appears there. So you can also answer me and say hello, come. <laughs> but that's one thing you can do. You can, of course, then use this chat function to ask questions and to interact. Or at some point, we might be asking you some questions. Like maybe my first question to all of you would be uh, that you could just type, in, type to us in which city and country you are located. So for example, I would then type that I'm in Bonn, Germany, so that we have an idea of who is where. So if you please can do that, we have a better idea of where you are coming from. That would be very nice. So I see that Barbara is typing now, so that's nice. And Daniel, too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ah, Amsterdam, nice. Ah, Daniel, I know where you are. <laughs> <laughs> we get an idea of uh, where we all are. I think that's nice. So, welcome in uh, Stuttgart. So that's one way to interact. It's nice to introduce ourselves, but also if you have specific questions that you would like to see covered at some point, we can mark them as question. And at Later on, we might have a question and answer session where your questions will appear and we can uh, discuss them. So that's a nice tool. Oh, Canada, nice. And France. So we have quite an international crowd, which makes sense uh, looking at the subject of today's um, webinar. Okay, before we get into this specific handbook, I would like to have a short explanation of what is the uh, Singmin project. I won't make it long because maybe you know. The Singmin project was uh, started actually in October 16, if I'm correct. And we gathered 11 organizations all across Europe, I mean, down to Turkey, uh, Lebanon, up to Finland, uh, to try to work uh, around the question of how collective singing can help in the integration process of young migrants. That was the main theme. Uh, and we got the support of the Erasmus Plus uh, program of the European Union, and it was very welcome. It allowed us to dedicate some working time, research, and production means, and create events around this, this project. And I think we achieved uh, our main aims. But the question is, why would the, such a network as ours look into this question? We might be personally interested, but that's not a sufficient reason. The fact is that over the years, we had a lot of contacts with organizations, choirs, conductors, professionals, and amateurs, uh, telling us that they were trying to set up projects around integration, sometimes succeeding, sometimes failing on some aspects, um, um, facing challenges and developing solutions. And as usual, because we are a European network, we said, OK, we have to do something there, try to gather the uh, important uh, experience they have and share that. But these were one-to-one -one, uh, relation. 
We also had some statistical evidence that this might make sense, uh, at least on the European scale. In 2000, between 13 and 15, we ran a big survey across Europe. We had more than 5,000 choirs answering it. It was called Singing Europe. You can actually uh, download the whole report on singingeurope.org. We have learned a few things, like we have 37 million singers in Europe. Nice. But we also ask questions. Uh, and one of the questions was, why are you singing together? Why are you interested in collective singing? Of course, they want to make concerts. That's what they said. They want to contribute to the singer's general well-being. That's nice. One uh, item was, uh, we want to contribute to social integration of singers of different generations or cultural backgrounds. So we said, yeah, that's something interesting there. So that's about 65% of the choirs claim that that was part of their aims. And not all of them were successful. So um, that means only half of them were successful, which lets us to think that maybe about half a million choir would be interested in the social integration, generally speaking. Part of them are related to migrants. So we had some evidence. And we started this project on this basis. So now this project dealing with collective singing and integration process of young migrants for for whom are we designing this project? We had, of course, a final target group. And these are um, young people in different European countries. What we mean there, they are the, the children and young people actually benefiting from the projects that maybe you will be setting up uh, based on these handbooks. But the people we are directly addressing with our productions, with the handbooks and the ideas we try to share, are the professional in the youth fields, in the musical fields, conductors of uh, children choirs, or music and school teachers. We try to have a, a large uh, um, uh, array of uh, people who might be interested in this project. And finally, we need people, of course, multipliers, as they are called, to spread this information, networks, uh, the media, and so on, organizations. So that's in, in a few words the idea. The project was run by actually uh, researching both the scientific literature when it existed, but specifically to look in the fields in all the countries covered by the partners uh, to collect existing experiences that had been run and interview the people and try to understand the challenges and the solution they developed to overcome these challenges along the way and condense that in practical, easy to read 30 page booklets. That's that simple. Um, so that people who want to set up their own project in different fields could do it. Um, that was not so complicated. The end books, or the final, sorry, the final results of the theme in project are three end books that you can download in 11 languages. So it goes from English to Finnish, uh, through Arabic, Turkish, I mean, you name it. Um, and so these are these handbooks. And we decided to write three different handbooks because the situations are different. One, and we will be talking about it today uh, with our two other uh, presenters, is uh, singing with groups of young refugees. I won't talk much about it because we will. The second one, um, and you will have a webinar on Monday about this one, is including young people with migration background in existing choir. And that the context is a bit different. It would be a choir, an existing choir somewhere uh, who face the need or has the will to integrate people uh, in their activities. And people with different cultural backgrounds. That may be migrants, it may be actually people coming from another social uh, strata or whatever, because these differences exist also, which means these handbooks can also be used uh, in a context where you're not dealing actually with migrants, but with people with any type of difference with your main audience. And finally, and we had a webinar about it yesterday, the third one is about working in a school environment. And there, the situation is of course also a bit different. So we try to make quite specific uh, recommendations and proposals for these different direct target groups. So today we'll be talking about the first of these handbooks. Uh, but maybe that's a good time to ask you one question um, about 
No, I will just talk also quickly about the repertoire guide because actually we had three handbooks plus a fourth companion guide. It's a repertoire guide uh, trying to answer the question for all of these uh, challenges in terms of musical contents. What can you sing? How can you sing it? Um, and where can you find the sources? And I will come back after the presentation of the handbook about this one at the end of the, the webinar. So stay with us. Um, so maybe I will first introduce my, my colleagues who will be presenting the uh, next <laughs> handbooks. So or I will let you introduce yourself. Maybe, Janan, if you want to start. Hello. I am Jana from Istanbul, Turkey. Uh, I am a board member of uh, Koro Kültürü Derneği in English, Choir Culture Association. And I'm also the social media manager and uh, bulletin editor there. Uh, as a job, I do uh, singing. I'm a singer and academician and a children choir uh, conductor. Nice to meet you and thank you for attending this uh, webinar. Yes. Daniel, if you want to say a word. Yeah. <laughs> yes, maybe. Are you muted? Okay, technical problems sometimes. Hello. Ah, perfect. Welcome. <laughs> Hi everyone. I'm uh, I'm Daniel. I work um, at uh, Ung Ikor, which is the Norwegian Children's and Youth Choirs organization. Where I've been working with well, a lot of different things as uh, usual in these kinds of organizations, and I also was uh, involved in the uh, late stage of this um, Sing Me In project, um, uh, also translating uh, the works into Norwegian. So. Okay. So before we start with your presentation, I would also like to actually ask the, the participants there to let us know uh, who they are. And you will see on your screen appearing a short questionnaire. And you can actually click several of these items because you might be a choir conductor and a volunteer working, of course, with uh, in this field. And I'll let you answer and then we can discuss the results uh, quickly. I would. Uh, uh, use this opportunity in these few minutes to remind our friends who are following us on Facebook right now that they can also join us because on Facebook they cannot answer these questions. They cannot interact with us through chat. So please join us on the Click Meeting platform. You will find the, the link on your on the comments of the, the video. We would be very happy to have you with us now um, and interact. So I see uh, people are slowly answering, giving us answers. Um, I'm the only one who can see the results right now, but be sure I will share it with, with you in a few seconds. I'll give you one, one minute still. Um, I would also like to remind the participants that are with us that you can actually write directly on the chat and interact with us. If you have questions, if you have a technical problem whatsoever, Julia is also here to help us and interact. Can you say something? <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Does anybody want to answer anymore? Okay. So we had five answers. I will stop the voting. We will have other questions. Don't worry. And I can share the results with you. I guess you can see them. Uh, so we have uh, most people claiming to be musicians, choir conductors, and other. I don't know what it means. Oh, yes. I got it there. I teach Dutch. Hello, Ida. I did that to foreign pupils who start in a Belgian school coming from abroad. Okay, so you are in a school context also. So you might want also to read the, the other handbook for the school context, but this one might be also interesting. You can actually use different ideas from all these handbooks. So thank you for answering the, the questionnaire. So now I will actually uh, leave the, the board, uh, the floor, not the board, uh, to my colleagues there. And I think you are starting, Dania. Am I correct? Yeah, yeah I'm starting. So, okay. oh, uh, great, switching to the presentation. So, uh, hi everyone again. I'm uh, Daniel and I uh, work at the Norwegian organization.
Hello. We have lost Daniel, I think. Okay, I think we are back. We have lost Daniel for the start of the presentation. Uh, and then, can you hear me? Yes, uh, if you okay. want, I can uh, present can... the second half of the presentation. And if we uh, find out what happened about Daniel, then he can do the to his part. What do you think? Daniel is there. I will bring him back in. Okay, up, up. I think we have Daniel coming back again. Sorry for the technical problem that happens sometimes over the internet. Daniel, can you hear us? I'm, I can hear you, and I really hope you can hear me for more than 10 seconds this time. Yes, OK, please, you can start. OK, so I'm going to take you through uh, roughly the first half uh, of this uh, handbook, uh, which is uh, three, well, two chapters and the introduction. Uh, and I'm not going to obviously read uh, the contents to you, but just take you through what's in there. And that's the introduction. It's the first chapter on how to get started, which is about preparation mainly, and a chapter about attitudes towards this kind of work. So, uh, the very first thing, as I should mention, as, as Combe touched on earlier, is how uh, the contents of this book came to be. So, uh, the information is based on basically two things. Uh, uh, questionnaires that have been sent out to lots of conductors and project leaders across Europe. And uh, secondly, uh, in-depth interviews with um, some of the most relevant answer people who answered the questionnaires. Um, in Norway, for instance, we have uh, done uh, interviews with uh, people who uh, in uh, collaboration with Ungikor, did workshop at different kinds of uh, refugee centers in Norway. Uh, this was mainly in 2016 and 2017. Um, and uh, th those people who were, went to yeah different uh, um, refugee centers across the country where they had music workshops. So. Uh, the handbook starts out with kind of a, a motivational part on why you should do this. And I, I'm quite sure this is maybe the thing that you have been, you already have your answer to this, but I'm still going through it. So the first answer is that it works. And, um, uh, and I mean, this is, we know this because there's a lot of research on the positive benefits uh, from singing together, both socially and psychologically, which is obviously very relevant for the target group here. And the fact that singing makes you healthier should speak for itself. Um, the second one, uh, the second answer is that it is possible. And this is um, kind of a different take. I mean, Obviously, there are very good, a lot of good things that people could do when working with refugees, but that for logistical reasons are very difficult to organize. I mean, just compare choir singing to making music with instruments. Uh, that would require a lot more work and a lot more funding. So singing is uh, relatively cheap and simple to organize. And, uh, and as it says here, it's also very, very flexible. It's a kind of activity that's it's easy to find a place. And the third answer is that it's needed. Uh, singing with refugees is needed as, um, as an activity, as a distraction uh, for the refugees. It's a forum for, um, for human exchange and for emotions. And it's also a, a rewarding activity in itself. And it's a way to um, be able to uh, develop as a human being also while being in a in, in a place like a refugee center. So, uh, the introduction also continues with a, a short story. Um, because uh, when doing this, we also were in contact with Norwegian researchers uh, who had been working with these kinds of questions. So, uh, this story is called From Song to Language. And it's uh, actually a story about um, 
how uh, a three-year-old girl um, uh, who was very, very shy in kindergarten, and she has a lot of trouble making friends, and she has trouble communicating with other children, and she has trouble getting included in the group. So uh, Nora uh, Bilalovic Kulset, who uh, tells this story, um, tells how this girl actually finds a way in uh, into the group through singing, because while singing she can learn the words and the melody to a song and also participate in an activity with the other children. And when she actually shows this to uh, the other children um, during a singing session at kindergarten, the children afterwards started including her in, in, in the group and in the play. And uh, by telling this, she wants to prove um, kind of an important point, something that's called the double bind. And as I uh, written here, uh, it's a term to kind of describe an, a catch-22 uh, when it comes to language acquisition, that you need language to make friends, but you need friends to learn the language properly. And this obviously is something that goes for all ages and not just three-year-olds. So, um, I just also should remind you if there's anyone watching this at uh, Facebook uh, at this moment that if you go into, um, uh, if you find the link uh, to, to uh, the click meeting platform, you can, uh, you can actually go inside the presentation where you also can join a forum and answer all these uh, fantastic questions we'll be asking you and so on. So I hope you'll all join us here. So, the first chapter, how to get started, uh, is about preparation. Uh, and and uh, in preparation, we kind of go through, uh, we separate preparation into six uh, different areas. And what you see here is how we have uh, divided these uh, parts of preparations into different kind of themes. I'm not going through all of them here, but I'd like to uh, point out the first two. Uh, the first one um, is actually having having an idea, knowing what you want to do, is uh, maybe the very, very the most important one for everyone, um, because it it uh, makes you it helps you know where your focus will be, um, and it also kind of connects with uh, all the other themes in uh, in this book, including the one about attitudes that I'll be coming to later. Uh, the second theme, research, uh, is not uh, connected to reading uh, uh, the, uh, the scientific research about the field itself, uh, but about researching the people you will be working with. Uh, so make sure you know who they are, where they're from, what ages they are, and so on. And also uh, make sure you know what rules apply when you're working at a particular ref refugee centre, or an accommodation, because those rules can vary a lot from place to place and country uh, to country. Um, I'm not uh, saying a lot more about the other four now, uh, because uh, how important they are can vary a lot, uh, depending on your project. So we also uh, have a short, uh, a, a short part about different challenges you can meet while working uh, with this. And most of the challenges are connected to predictability. And this goes for short-term and long-term predictability. For instance, uh, on an EU level, uh, we can see how the migrant streams are uh, greatly affected by different policies. And uh, the same for national level. Uh, and this also um, goes actually for funding a lot. Uh, the Norwegian example here, uh, as I've written, is about how the funding for some projects we did in Norway went from um, quite a generous funding uh, for doing different projects, uh, that uh, we had good feedback from the people who participated um, uh, and the people who we applied funding from, but after two years everything basically was dropped out. And also, actually, during these seminars where we had people doing workshops at refugee centers, we experienced 
plan uh, different workshop in one place just to find out that this very center was being closed down or moved on a very short notice. So we just had to move the activity to a new place. And uh, on, a, on an even smaller perspective, uh, the day-to-day, um, because you can never be sure if the, uh, you have the same people turning up every week. So uh, the important lesson to learn from this is when working with refugees, you can never be quite flexible enough. At least that's our experience in, in Norway. So, uh, moving on to attitudes, which is the second chapter. Uh, here comes another story from a Norwegian researcher, uh, Anne Haugland Balsnes, who has been uh, studying, uh, among other things, uh, an intercultural choir a uh, multicultural choir uh, in the south of Norway. And in the handbook, she tells a great story about Louis, who's a refugee from, from the genocide in Rwanda, who joins a choir uh, in Norway. And uh, he very strongly, as she tells, uh, experiences how this choir um, makes him feel like someone who can contribute uh, mainly because the choir gave him a place to be and the choir gave him tasks and things to do uh, and different paths that he could that he could do for the choir and uh, in the story Balsnes tells um, that this is uh, very much part of the philosophy uh, of the choir uh, where they work with a lot of individual follow-up on uh, the different members to make sure that they feel like uh, a part of the group and there's a lot of food on the social as aspects with for instance uh, a lot of food and drinks in the breaks uh, making sure that there are a lot of social interaction between the singers and of course having a principle that anyone can sing and she uh, calls the 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 um, the principle or the ideology of the choir for uh, she calls it hospitable choir singing which is also the the name of this short story so uh, why should singing with migrants be any different uh, before mentioning this i should say uh, once again that if there's anyone watching uh, at facebook right now Remember to uh, join us at the Click Meeting platform. You should find a link uh, in the in the comments, so you can join us here at Click Meeting for the presentation. So, speaking of attitudes towards this kind of work, why should singing with migrants be any different? And in a way, it shouldn't, because we assume. Um, as a, as a statement, uh, at some point we would like to assume that we all have a lot of common goals uh, and a lot of common dreams. Uh, but our starting points can be very, very different. And we think that uh, keeping this in mind is very important for any project. And um, we also uh, uh, want to point out a few things that you should keep in mind, uh, mainly about flexibility. Uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, because you, it's, I, we think it's important to accept that things will never turn out as planned. That's actually one of the uh, feedbacks we had from our, from the conductors who did our workshops, that things never turn out as planned. So there's a fine balance between conveying your expectations, but still managing to keep an open, an open door uh, for the people who have difficulty uh, joining uh, the different workshop or the choirs and this actually connects a lot to the story about Louis because uh, the center of of that story is how the attitude of the conductor um, uh, has towards the singers and uh, that this attitude actually is the thing that makes makes the choir work uh, a last thing we would like to point out is that it's important to do this kind of job for the right reason. Uh, so you don't see the refugees as a, a thing or just a means for your own work, but 
it's important that the project is about uh, the refugees or the migrants. So um, to have a lot of empathy, to be able to see uh, things from the perspective of the refugees and make sure the project's about them and not you or your ambitions. So uh, those are basically the contents of uh, the second chapter. So uh, Tana, I'm going to pass the microphone to you, uh, uh, metaphorically. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, for this presentation. Uh, now it's your relaxing time. Uh, I'm taking uh, with chapter three, four and five, uh, which are a uh, repertoire leading the sessions and performances. Uh, repertoire is uh, important because you have a very special group of people here you are dealing with. Uh, you have to uh, take in mind uh, the ages, uh, the profiles and cultural backgrounds and musical backgrounds also. Uh, these people all come from different cultural backgrounds and they may not be very acquainted to the uh, European type of uh, musical uh, looking uh, place. And uh, they all have a very different experience of being a refugee that we may not know as a, a teacher or a choir conductor. And uh, therefore, you have to take all these considerations in mind when you are uh, trying to find out about the repertoire. Uh, how to decide on the repertoire? First of all, you have to create an initial pool. Uh, you can start with rather uh, lively and cheerful songs, uh, for example, children's songs or uh, traditional folk songs. Uh, and also teaching through repetition is important uh, since they may not know about the Western musical notations and they may be holding a, a hard copy of a score the first time. And uh, you should always keep in mind uh, to keep in mind being easy, not uh, not giving difficult uh, stuff uh, on them. Uh, the main purpose here is socialize and uh, having fun and singing together. Uh, also, they may not know anything about uh, polyphony. They may be only hearing more monophonic songs in their life. Uh, so, first of all, you may uh, try to uh, find some monophonic songs, uh, single lines, single melodies. And you may uh, decide uh, dividing sections into uh, physical uh, groups in the room, so they may, they will try to understand there are two. They may be two different uh, sounds, uh, melodies at the same time. Uh, first of all, you can start with easy canons such as flute canon, which you can find in um, your, uh, your Pakantas, uh booklet. You know, mango, 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 kiwi, 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 kiwi. I'm sure many of you know this song. And uh, we may ask at this point if you have any comments uh, that you remember that you work with in your children's choirs or refugee choirs, you can type in there. And uh, rather uh, only working with a cappella, you can introduce uh, instruments such as piano, guitar. So it will be uh, easier for the refugee singers uh, to get acquainted uh, to the music uh, and it will uh, embellish the atmosphere. And also you can use uh, their expertise such as microtonal macams or ornamental singing uh, that European uh, ears may not be very uh, acquainted, uh, but uh, the Eastern people know better. So you can add these elements to the music that you are creating together. Uh, let's talk about choir participation in repertoire. Uh, you can create a repertoire group uh, which will be searching songs uh, for the choir, so they will feel more uh, a democratic participation and they will uh, be, feel more belonging to the atmosphere and they will feel they will be feeling uh, that they are giving artistic decisions so uh, it will be a more friendly and democratic environment for the choir. What about the language? Uh, you should definitely use the language of the host country so they will be acquainted to these uh, words that they are uh, they are on the land. So they, they will be more uh, they will know more about the country that they are living in. That's for sure very important. Also, you can include native language uh, because uh, these refugee people will be very happy to share their own culture with you. Another uh, idea can be neutral language. 
uh, because uh, this time you'll be at the same level with them. For example, in Germany, uh, you will learn African songs with Syrian refugees, so they will feel more equal uh, with you. Or you may use no language at all. Uh, for example, using vowel songs, um, like la 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 la. This is a little canon we were teaching in Turkey. Uh, so this uh, sounds like you can use such words. Uh, so it will be easier to teach songs uh, to children, especially with these little uh, sounds. Or you can just be creative, improvise, have fun uh, when you are dealing uh, with music. Uh, they, as I have told you, they may never have seen a, 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 read a, a score before in their life, so they will be more equipped to, to learning by ear and re by repeating you. Uh, so uh, you can use little games and icebreakers uh, and Maybe you may type in here what kind of icebreakers you use. For example, I remember one uh, while you are throwing balls to each other, repeating your names in a circle. So uh, it creates a great atmosphere and people learn each other's name. I think the presentation, huh, here it is. Uh, let's talk about chapter four, which is leading the session. Uh, there may be very unconventional challenges, uh, such as uh, the singers may be forced uh, to go to the choir atmosphere and sit there uh, by the refugee center. Uh, it may be it may be their first time singing in their whole lives, uh, or uh, they may be religiously distant to singing. They may not prefer to sing, and uh, also. Attendance is an important point because uh, they may not prefer to come at every rehearsal, or they may not uh, be easy, uh, they they may not read the course, uh, they may not understand any notations. Also, they may not understand your own language. Uh, these are all unconventional challenges. Uh, the most important thing uh, to, uh, here is that you should always consider in mind that uh, nothing can be exactly as planned. Uh, so you'll be less stressful at, at every point of the project. To start with, you have to create a decent room with a stable temperature and good lighting and enough chairs for people to sit. These are all very uh, conventional uh, stuff. Uh, it is no different than any other choir rehearsal. And uh, sometimes it is not allowed to food, uh, to eat and drink uh, during rehearsal, of course, but it may really help sustainability and motivation. It creates a very friendly atmosphere, uh, especially uh, cooking their own food and uh, presenting them to you. It will uh, make the atmosphere very friendly uh, before singing, so we advise it. During the rehearsal, you may start with icebreakers, uh, which may be non-musical. Uh, to uh, create the repertoire, you have to find how difficult it should be according to the age uh, profile, according to the language, how many different languages the refugees speak in your environment. And uh, religion is also important. Uh, an, an example about this uh, may be that a very, very uh, easy, simple, naive song about ships, uh, the sea may be very difficult, uh, may remind the refugees a very di difficult moment from their lives, for example, running away from a country to another country. So they may bring very traumatic, uh, traumatic moments uh, from their life, so you should be careful uh, about choosing your repertoire and about the words. Uh, so uh, the most important thing is uh, the process, uh, not what's going on, with her, uh, what, will be, uh, hap what will happen at the end, uh, but just uh, focus on the process and let it uh, be uh, easygoing life. Uh, you, uh, what about the uh, language and communication? Uh, they, uh, these people may not be acquainted to Western gestures for conducting like uh, these and uh, three, four, or four, four. So you have to find the body language, uh, common gesture list, and uh, specific keywords, especially for children, it will be very helpful. 
and uh, you should use imitation as a tool. Mm -hmm. uh, say some words and they will imitate you and uh, they will ear, learn by ear and by clapping the rhythms and uh, call and response methods. Uh, these are very important methods uh, while teaching, especially the children. Um, a very important thing is there should be some people in the room that will translate all the words, uh, lyrics of the songs. If a, a native song uh, will be sung, they should all understand the words. It's very important. Uh, let's talk about some uh, challenges with these cases. For example, uh, from Istanbul, Turkey, uh, Tarlabaşı Social Center, a uh, choir conductor uh, talked about the differences in musical backgrounds. Uh, the children uh, may not have uh, very clear ears, may not give the sounds on the piano uh, very accurately. So it's very difficult to create a choir with all these different uh, musical background people. Uh, another example is from our country, the Resort Center on Asylum and Migration. Uh, here, a female conductor says that uh, she is not acceptable uh, in the atmosphere because they don't uh, trust the female or they don't count on what the female says. So such things uh, can be can occur. And uh, an Afghan youth choir, uh, a choir conductor in this choir told us uh, that uh, the children are not always uh, on time and uh, they have in their maybe the, in their culture to go late uh, to a specific thing. Uh, so you can all um, see such problems. The role of conductor is very important. Uh, you don't only uh, you don't act as a musical leader, but you should also be a good listener a team builder, a manager. You have to organize, for example, the bus that you, that will take you to the concert place or the concert uh, hall. You have to organize all these things. Uh, and being a good listener is also very important. They, they won't only talk to you about a musical score or a song, but they will also go to you as a, a friend. They will tell you their psychological problems, anything, because uh, there are great traumas at the background. And you are teach, trying to teach them things. So the atmosphere, the environment should be very friendly. What works uh, for the conductor uh, is uh, emotional uh, bonding to all these uh, choir singers. And you should make them believe that music will help them uh, psychologically, physically, in every aspect of their life. Uh, let's ask you a question here. Uh, some people think that performance, this is chapter five now, performance uh, is not important, it is not necessary, uh, but it varies from case to case. Uh, would you please uh, maybe type in what you think, if it is necessary or not, uh, considering refugee singers. Some people that think, uh, think that it is just a loss of energy and time, it's not important, and uh, it can be very hard to make and unnecessary. Uh, some people think that it creates a stronger group motivation, sharing a specific aim, uh, hearing all these claps, uh, applause. Maybe the children uh, are on the stage for the first time in their life. And it's a great uh, experience to feel that you are being loved, you are being respected. We will be self-esteem and self-respect uh, at this point. Uh, I think that uh, you should go as much as you can until the performance day, and you, they should uh, feel this performance, they should experience this moment. I think that it's a great experience uh, to be on the stage, uh, whether you are a refugee or not. So I approve it. What do you think? Julia says that from Facebook there is a comment. Body language while singing is very useful, that's right. Uh, let's talk about challenges in the performances. Uh, some people may not come to the performance, although they attended all the uh, rehearsals. Uh, also, they may not be acquainted, they may not be familiar with Western concert practices, such as going on the stage, and they may not uh, deal with their stage right. Even a normal person cannot uh, deal with it. And, uh, how when they are being applauded, uh, when they are leaving the stage, 
uh, what to do in front of the audience, and bowing, these are all concerns. Uh, if they are coming from a not a very uh, Western uh, lifestyle, uh, and there may be financial challenges such as performing may cost. Uh, so, for example, even the concert hall should be near to the refugee center. Uh, so, you should always think uh, about these matters. You should have them in mind. And uh, if you will perform, uh, you should. Uh, Prepare your singer psychologically, and for example, during the rehearsals, you can create a concert atmosphere, such as uh, one group of people will be sitting and watching the other group of people who will be performing. So you will create this uh, concert atmosphere. They will be acquainted, familiar with the stage uh, rights, and they'll be uh, better at, during the stage performance. And uh, you should be ready to have poor musical results. You should not always expect the highest level from uh, these people. And uh, you should always ask for help whenever you need, for example, for venue, audience. And uh, you may ask uh, also the refugee audience is an important audience. Uh, the people who are not singing and refugees can also listen to you. They may be your, their own uh, audience. And uh, enjoying the experience is the most important thing and being a part of the process, uh, uh, not only the result is important. A uh, choir conductor said that uh, discipline combined with compassion and understanding lead you to a successful performance. I liked uh, this quotation a lot. Uh, now the presentation is over, but I want to share with you a YouTube link uh, that I was a part of. Uh, this is a, a Turkish uh, uh, district uh, governor uh, decided to uh, bring all these refugee children from uh, 22 countries, especially Syria and Korean Tajikistan. Uh, they are like uh, 185 children on the stage after this project. Uh, here is a photo of me uh, at the end of the uh, per per performance. They are all, all the children are holding flowers. They are from all nationalities. Some of them don't know Turkish. Uh, they are in a Turkish uh, school. And uh, here is the um, performance of them. This is a Turkish uh, pop song, uh, which every Turkish uh, person knows. They are singing in Turkish and English. So this part is in English, it's not very understandable, but they are talking about uh, peace in the whole world. Uh, and in this concert, they are singing in languages of English, Arabic, Russian and Turkish uh, at the same time. And after this concert, uh, they found out that the post-traumatic stress disorder of the children were decreased. So thank you for listening to me. Uh, I'm very happy to be a part of this uh, project of these webinars. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. So that was the presentation of the handbook. I would really like to thank. So these are two of the partners, uh, a member of the partner organization who worked on this big project. Uh, we had, I think, about 40 to uh, 45 people actually writing on the books, doing the translations, contributing. It was, it was a big adventure there. So it's very nice to still be in touch with each other. And we still have a lot of feedback from readers about this thing. The last part of the presentation will be a very short introduction and presentation of two things. Uh, the first one will be the, the repertoire guide, and then, and maybe more importantly in a way, uh, to show you very briefly the, 
the what's called the Musica International Database. So I will skip directly there in my presentation. So I've already mentioned it, but one of the production of the theming project uh, is the repertoire guide. In these documents, uh, as you have heard uh, Daniel and Challen tell you, um, it's very important to not only have scores and music, but also to have musical games, to have uh, activities you can do that are musical activities, but are there to link people together, to bring them together. And we have actually in this handbook, uh, for this handbook, listed a lot of games that can be used in these different contexts where you are working with migrants. So I would really invite you to get them. You have direct links to YouTube, uh, to a YouTube playlist, because we have also ourselves recorded in video most of these songs, so you can use them as an inspiration. But the second part of this uh, handbook uh, is about gathering a big collection of songs, and, and yes, yeah, songs mainly, coming from different parts of the world. The idea being that if you want to work with people coming from another culture, you can decide to just ask them to do and be what you are, or you can start an exchange. And one way to exchange is to say, look, I have this one song from your country. Can we sing it together? And then uh, you can build a bridge with this one song or these few songs. And they can bring you actually, say, no, that's not the right one, use this one. You start a relation and you empower the people you are working with, which is especially important when working with refugees, which is the end. So in this guide, you find also a big thing. You can look in the guide, but you can also then use an online tool that I would really like to present now. It's called the MusicaNet database. Uh, Musica uh, International is an uh, association based in France, actually, and that has developed over the years a very large multilingual database of choral uh, works. So it's mainly a repertoire database. I don't know uh, who knows uh, Musica uh, amongst yourself, but I would really invite you to go to musicanet.org and check it out. Because there, you can actually search for all types of choral repertoire. You can enter the voices you want to, uh, to use, the duration, the language of the song, and so on, and the style. So it's a very rich system, and then you have access to a lot of information. In this particular case, they have implemented the singing keyword, which means if you go to the, this is only the basic uh, search interface, but you can add a lot of other criteria. So you just type sing me in, and you get, for example, a set of answers that are tagged as uh, being part of sing me in. And then this is an example, and there you can see that some of them uh, offer you text, video, and thing. And this is a typical uh, entry in the database. Uh, so maybe, I don't know how you pronounce that. But usually, even if I don't know how to pronounce it, in a lot of the songs, you also have access to extra information. You may have access to a score or part of the score. You may have access to pronunciation files. And in the singing project, we created a lot of pronunci pronunciation files. It's a difficult word to pronounce uh, over the years. And we, uh, you have access to videos. You have access to also link to a publisher if you can buy it. So I would really uh, invite you to go to uh, musicanet.org and, and check it out because it's a very nice tool for musicians interested in choral music and especially in this uh, field of, uh, of uh, integration. So I think we, we went through the, the, our program and we have used 56 minutes of our time. So we are still in time, that's fine. Um, yes, I see we have some remarks there. Um, is there a contact mail address if questions occur in the future? Yes, please contact us at the European Choral Association. Either we will answer the questions or you can just, uh, we will just forward that to a specialist if we know some and try to help, of course, any project stemming from this uh, initiative. Um, I can see, oh, let's open the question mode there since we have questions. Up. Oh. Hmm? So there, that was a question. So yes, sorry? Ah, you can use, of course, writing to the European Choral Association. This is info at europeanchoralassociation.org. We will put that in the chat. But you can find that by Googling the association or looking at the website singmin.eu. You won't find it. 
Uh, I have another question. You need a login. I think it's about the Musicanet uh, uh, website, if I'm correct. And uh, <laughs> the same German, yes and no. Without a login, you can actually access, I think, 50, the 51st results of your search. But in most cases, if your search is quite uh, defined, you already have 50. If you already have 50 answers, that's already good. Then you can log in and uh, using you can register on the website. I think you can use also your a membership to a national organization, to some international organization. So if you are a member of the European Core Association, you have a free access to the whole database, for example. That's one of the advantages of becoming a member. But the basic usage is still free. Then I'm going through the question. Have any member of your organization dealt with trauma healing processes using singing? So as far as we are concerned, uh, European Core Association, and I think most of the partners, um, the feedback we had, and please correct me, uh, Daniel or Chalan, but us usually, the, if you really reach a situation where you can detect a real trauma in a child, collective singing is not the um, only tool that can solve this type of questions. It has to be a common work with uh, social workers, psychologists, other type of institutions because, and then it can actually be powerful in combination. But at some point we have to know our limitations and I think that's the feedback we had in most cases. You can go up to a certain point and then you really have to uh, combine forces with other specialists. That's the, the, uh, what we advocate at least in the handbooks. Uh, at least talk with people there. So we are not uh, specialized, an organization specialized in, in traumatic situation. Uh, so that would be my answer there. So yeah, okay. I don't know if we have any other questions that you would like to ask. We may ask them uh, uh, maybe if they witnessed any problems, uh, uh, challenges uh, with refugees, if, if they worked with refugees. Uh, has any one of you already worked with refugees and would like to share something? We can even invite somebody to speak if it works, if we can manage the video. Would anybody would like to speak live on the camera? No? We won't force anybody to become famous. Not <laughs> have experience. Okay, Baba says she has no experience yet. Okay. That's okay. For example, but, but, even if they know the language, uh, they may not prefer to talk to you in person, a child, for example, after a traumatic uh, event, mm -hmm. uh, refuse talking. This may be a uh, problem mm -hmm. with refugee children. Yeah. So they may, you may make them uh, think, and this, this, this may be the only communication way that they communicate to, to you to, or to another person. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry. So, Barbara Schmidt and Soring, so I will just publish it, I guess, so we can all read it. In our work with refugees, the diversity is quite a problem. Often Africans don't want to cooperate with Arabics and vice versa. Yes, of course, you have <laughs> racism is the most shared <laughs> question uh, in the world, unfortunately. So, I uh, um, Integration goes all the ways, yes, and we have seen that, of course, in other situations. And what are solutions were you able to find, if any? Maybe you can share that with us. And did you specifically work on that? For example, Bible, if you... trying to find some uh, similarities between African and Arabic traditional songs may be a way of... Um, Dealing with this problem. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I was typing, Bravo is typing. It would be nice if you could have you talking, but that's okay. I can read your answer. So, 
in the meantime, and the uh, tone systems, different musical traditions, solo group forms are very different, but I know there are no easy solutions. This is the contribution. Yes, we also try to address this question in the uh, handbook and also in the uh, uh, repertoire handbook. Not only the cultural traditions are different, but of course the way of thinking music, of hearing music, the tonal systems are sometimes an interesting question um, because we hear different uh, scales and temperaments and you have to deal and play with it. It's not always easy. In some Arabic cultures, the only fact of singing uh, in polyphony is not an usual thing. And so some people are also working on specific repertoire to deal with the quarter tones uh, system with the, with the polyphony. So that's also some work is being done there, but it's also a long process. And uh, you have to find ways to, to bridge the traditions also. So, and yeah. improvisation can be a key point here. Maybe adding these two different uh, musical backgrounds to a single music and creating their own music in one single uh, musical piece could be a good idea. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. So I think if you don't have many other questions, we might then close the session because we are over one hour now and we are planned around one hour. Please keep on interacting. You can send us emails, uh, read the, the handbooks that you can remind you download on singme.eu for free. You can share them um, as broadly as possible. I think we had uh, over 6,000 uh, downloads already. So we are quite happy with that. But we would be also interested to have feedback of the readers a bit more. And if you ever use them to have your own project running, it would be wonderful. So we'd like to thank uh, our two, uh, my two colleagues here. And uh, hopefully we uh, will have other webinars together, or you can meet us at any of the events of our association or the European Association. So thank you very much. Uh, have a nice day. And Oh, I still have one question. Shall we take another one? Uh -huh. How do you manage to? How, how do you manage if you decide to ask somebody to teach a song you don't know from his country? Who wants to answer that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. If it was a question. Ah, if I understand the question, uh, it's how do you get somebody from a group to teach the others? Well, um, it's difficult to answer outside of the context, and there I think flexibility is the key, and and maybe uh, trying to get the to get the uh, the people teach you first. If you are the choir conductor, for example, if it's the case. Uh, we have seen uh, seen people who ask their singers from the, the groups and their refugees to bring them like a YouTube uh, extract or something and they try to learn the song with them and then teach it back to the rest of the group. So some people were advocating these kind of tools also as a way to involve the singers in the choice of the repertoire. Since, uh, as we said earlier, the process is very important. Um, singing together, this collective aspect is what is building integration and helping them uh, acquire languages, uh, for example. Uh, so even if the result is not perfect, seeing from your point of view of a uh, conductor or musical professional, that may also be okay. I don't know if that answered the question. Um, okay, so I would like to say thank you uh, to everyone and uh, uh, hope to see you in any of our events. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.